Our mission at SD Bullion is clear, the lowest cost gold and silver available online. While we do not have pretty blue boxes, free shipping on every order, or glamorous gold and silver infomercials, SD Bullion has the lowest prices that may save you hundreds on your next order. So before you make your next investment, do the math and join the over 40,000 new customers who have recently made the switch to SD Bullion. Why pay more? This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Well, Eric, we missed you last week, but it's been a tough 10 days for the markets. Gold and silver we're talking about here. Silver's down about a dollar and a half since we last spoke. Gold's down about 50, 60 bucks here. So it's recovered a bit here on Friday as we speak after uh, the jobs report disappointed a bit. Gold actually has, kind of importantly, gotten back above 1200 trading right about at its 100-week moving average at 12.03 here as we speak. Coming up on the 3 p.m. hour Eastern, silver had regained 17 for a while this morning, but uh, sold off a bit here this afternoon, trading right at about 16.95 as we record. So what's your take here as the market looks ahead to the expected rate hike next week? Do you think the worst is past, Eric? We got another two, two and a half days of pain ahead. Well, probably already priced in, and this has been uh, a, wait, a rate height escalation of uh, you know the Fed's forward guidance that's been with us very strongly since Yellen was flapping her lips last Friday, uh, March 3rd, at a business uh, conference speech. And, and, you know, that speech basically shifted sentiment very strongly into um, the expectation that a March raise was 100 percent probability. And now that the jobs report is out and it was a little bit stronger than what, you know, I mean, Bloomberg economists were expecting 200,000 jobs to be uh, created and uh, or rather the print to come in at uh, 200,000 and the print was 235,000 jobs. So, um, you know, the Fed pays a lot of attention to the wage element, the hourly wages that are um, embedded in the report. And that's now running at 2.8% uh, year over year uh, gains in hourly earnings. And they're going to latch onto that and probably uh, focus a little bit on that more so than they have in the past when they release their, um, their public statement on March 15th after they do their rate hike. And I do, in fact, think that they are going to raise interest rates. So really, you know, the open question is going to be how much of a focus they're going to put on um, a June possible hike and then the whole tenor that they um, put out to the market in terms of how they, you know, try to manage expectations. And they dial up when they want it, and then they dial down when they wish to calm fears that, you know, maybe at any given time if people are worried in the equities markets, for example, and the stock market might be selling off, they, they always dial back their expectations. And we've gone through these cycles, you know, many, many, many years since the 2008 crash. So all told, you know, the, I, I did, looking at how precious metals have traded this week, we have seen even stability this morning. Um, there was an interesting move in the euro. Uh, the, you know, the ECB and Draghi was out this morning talking about, uh, you know, possibility of changing the QE and uh, – and, and changing the expectations in Europe when it comes to the ECB. So the euro actually had a kind of counterintuitive leap higher. And I think that probably was part of what was helping gold this morning. But even before then, yesterday, day before, the, the really large declines that we've been suffering for you know, better part of two weeks now with this big correction. And it started with the, the miners even earlier than, than we had spoken about that last month, how the miners were basically attacked to try to take out one of the legs of the stool that was underneath the precious metals market. I mean, we had gold performing really well in February, went all the way to, uh, if memory serves, 12.63 and 80 cents or so, just right under the 200-day moving average, and then boom, <laughs> it's exactly when it was hit. And the sentiment had been changed in miners, so you know all of that was setting up to knock the legs out of the precious metals momentum, and that's what we always see. You know, the, 
whole fundamental backdrop for strong precious metals pricing it has been with us this entire year and the only possible exception that anyone could point to would be the interest rate normalization cycle and you know that's all largely priced in i mean we lost 63 dollars and change in in gold ever since that whole move began to be priced in and now we've sort of gone horizontal even with today's move uh, showing a small uptick in, in part of the day for gold so you know, a lot of times when we have had these shifts and we're dealing with a pending um, interest rate hike, um, the news gets out and then we see gold performing pretty well and miners as well performing nicely after we get an interest rate hike. We saw that after uh, December 14th. It took a few days before us to bottom out in uh, 2016. Uh, you know, right a couple days before Christmas, we hit our bottom and then we started moving up a lot. And 2015, uh, we saw the same pattern after the Fed raised their first and only interest rate hike back on um, December 16th, 2015. So, you know, markets do price things in advance, and there's been just so much focus on what's been going on with precious metals. I think the traders are going to be looking to buy the dip, or, or rather buy on the news, because yeah. we've priced in what's going on. And you can see that in the price action for the precious metals this week. I think the one note of caution that we'll have to wait and see is, I mean, it seems like most commentators in the precious metal sector are anticipating something similar because that's exactly what we've seen the last two times the Fed yeah. hiked rates both uh, back in December of 2015 and then again last year, December of 2016, gold and silver just absolutely hammered for about two months going into the rate hike when the Fed began telegraphing to the market their intentions. And then a, uh, a buy the news event where the rate hike is actually announced that gold and silver both started trading up uh, pretty strongly and they began pretty strong moves. Um, the one note of caution this time is that nobody is talking about too much is I wouldn't be surprised if um, next Wednesday Day, not only do the Fed does the Fed hike rates, but they also strongly um, hint at the fact that another rate hike is to come just a couple of months later in June. Which, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if they try to keep the pressure on gold and silver by starting the job boning immediately without any delay at the same time as they announce a rate hike. So it, it, yeah. remains to be, it remains to be seen whether gold and silver will respond exactly the same as they did the last two times if that happens. Um, certainly buying opportunity here, but will they go lower or not? Uh, yeah, we'll have to see. Silver, especially if you look more of a zoomed out view, six months, 12 month chart, I wouldn't be surprised if silver retests about 1650 here before bottoming, especially if it can't hold 17 today. But we'll see. Very promising to have gold back above 1200. It'd be even more promising to have gold close back above 1203 today at 100 week moving average. So uh, if you're listening to this, uh, click on those spot prices and see where gold and silver close the day and the week out, especially gold. If if gold can hang above 1203 and place a weekly close above those two levels, that would be important. We really don't want to see a weekly close below either of those levels, but especially below the psychological 1200. Yeah, you know, there's so much going on on the global macro front, too, that you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't try to fold that in and try to you know, guesstimate how that's going to impact the way the Fed might look at whether or not they really want to step on a gas pedal when it comes to job owning, particularly what's going on in China. I mean, their their credit markets are just really screwed up, and they're having a really hard time dealing with the you know rapid decline in the yuan versus U.S. dollar and other currencies, and, and it even looks like they're trying to manage the relationship between the U.S. dollar in particular, kind of like what they did last year in what was came to be known as the, the informal Shanghai Accord, where they would let uh, the renminbi decline against other currencies, particularly euro and, and so forth, but not really have huge tumultuous declines against the U.S. dollar, and we've gone through outright you know, shots across the bow that the Chinese central bank would send in the direction of the Fed anytime the Fed would want to raise interest rates. It was that time back in uh, August 2015 when um, the S&P 500 took a 10% hit when China had devalued very quickly and, and credit markets being what they are all interlinked and then hook up to the 
in the foreign exchange market and so forth created a lot of turmoil. So there's that. There's the possibility that Le Pen might actually win the first round in the French election, and if she does, then it's probably a foregone conclusion that over time, uh, if she's able to you know, become president of France, that France is going to throw a monkey wrench into the entire Eurozone. And so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very tumultuous uh, backdrop, and, you know, we can tick off lots of other things going on on the global macro slash geopolitical front. Um, one has to really wonder how the Fed is looking at all of this. Maybe, you know, Trump's month and a half, two months ago acceleration change on expectations for you know his administration seeking a lower dollar came as a pretty big shock and i think that that's somewhat empowering the fed and and i mean if we were standing at a 105 DXY index, for example, just to put a number on it that can contextualize, you know, dollar versus other currencies. The Fed wouldn't be as bold as they are right now when it comes to feeling the maneuverability to step on the jawbone and gas pedal and then make expectations such that, oh, we're going to have a, a June interest rate hike and possibly a third. That's their formal guidance, three this year. So we'll see. Um, what The scenario you're painting is definitely a possibility that they could actually decide to be more aggressive when it comes to what they tell the world when they unveil the interest rate hike that they probably will on March 15th. All right, well, shifting gears a little bit here, Eric, um, I want to discuss a story that's potentially a major black swan that's emerged in uh, the bullion industry, the gold and silver bullion industry here in the United States. Uh, it's a story that's been a couple of years in, it, in the making, but um, it just went mainstream here in the U.S., um, on Thursday, as Bloomberg Business Week released a full feature uh, front page expose, um, the title of it was How to Become an International Gold Smuggler. And we'll, in, we'll include a link to the, the Bloomberg uh, feature expose in the write-up. Um, but Bloomberg is, is alleging that um, – over $80 million of gold was illegally mined and smuggled into the U.S. markets. Um, and Bloomberg reports that the FBI and the Department of Justice in, is investigating um, NTR Metals, one of the largest uh, bullion firms in the U.S., over this issue. Um, NTR Metals, the parent company is Ella Metal. Um, and they're, they're one of the top two largest uh, refiners in the U.S., and they have just a massive, massive operation. Um, the parent company is uh, DGSC. Um, among their affiliates, they have uh, a massive recycling division. They own uh, Ohio Precious Metals. Uh, they bought them a couple of years ago. They bought uh, um, Provident Metals in the retail side a couple of years ago. And just a, a massive operation, as well as the fact that the NTR – uh, is uh, one of the the largest bullion wholesalers in the U.S. Um, massive amount of coin shops do business with them, as well as um, retail online dealers. Um, so we want to talk about a little bit about the potential implications um, if uh, these allegations from Bloomberg are substantiated and. Really, in my opinion, what you're looking at is the potential that uh, – I mean, if you're talking about the creditors like Scotia Makata, if Scotia pulls um, Ella Metals loans, you're looking at the potential for – um, a daisy chain type reaction um, of contagion in the, the bullion industry of counterparty risk. And we were chatting a little bit before the show. It's not exactly the same type of counterparty risk as the banking system with all their derivatives, but there's certainly counterparty risk in the industry, whether it be um, retail dealers, small coin shops, jewelers that have metal uh, being refined, um, any retailers or dealers that have purchased orders and have wired money and are uh, waiting for that product to be returned, retail investors, what have you, if if the bank if the the firm's creditors pull their credit line i mean it's certainly you could you could be looking at a situation where all, all the smaller guys or guys uh, that aren't number 1 on the creditors list are suddenly corzined. 
Yeah, definitely have a, an outsized impact on the industry. The other thing, too, is that, uh, you know, powers to be are always looking around at what goes on in terms of international finance and, you know, leakages of uh, capital in the time of you know, financial market turmoil. They, they'd like to have control over what's going on. And there's definitely a war on cash. We need only look at India to see that. And the backlash against gold as well there. It's both. And, you know, this does pose uh, an opportunity for, you know, Justice Department and so forth. I mean, even the Bloomberg story is quoting um, the assessment that the Justice Department is trying to make a really broad international case against international gold smuggling. And that kind of effort is something that people need to pay attention to because there always are uh, efforts to curtail the freedom of uh, the precious metals industry overall. You know, again, India is the perfect example. And, it, 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 you know, the war on cash is a global phenomenon. Governments all want uh, greater control over their financial markets and the, the ability to tax and to protect the banking system under conditions when there are, uh, you know, turmoil and market perturbations that, you know, make it such that there's possible runs on the bank and all that. I mean, th these considerations are part of why uh, there's a growing interest in having a cashless society. It isn't just, you know, anti-corruption. It isn't just the efficiency that all of the pundits and so forth or, the you know, the mainstream academics arguing for this, like people like Larry Summers, et cetera. Um, point to it's 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 an effort to control uh, money itself. So and I, when I see stories like this, I, I think I do think about the possibility of friction and, and and pain that can come with counterparties and just the functioning of the bullion industry. But there's also a political dynamic to this too. That at some point, politicians like to use examples like this as just you know arrows in their quiver to advocate for cashless society and so forth because they make the case that there's too much corruption and there's too much crime going on in in, in these darker pooled monies where not everything is, is controlled by the powers that be, and, and bullion is outside of the banking system. So they make a big deal out of this when there are issues like international smuggling going on. Yeah, I guess the ironic part is by cracking down on issues like this or, or others of illegal smuggling and illegal mining, it actually puts a damper on the overall physical gold output because this is physical gold. Yeah. Obviously, it's outside of the official system originally, but then it makes in it, it makes its way into the official system. I mean, the Ella Metal um, is LB, LBMA approved. I mean, they. They supply to all the biggest uh, everything in the world, from Fortune 500 companies uh, in their smartphones and their electronic devices to the, the largest bullion exchanges and approved warehouses, uh, and on and on it goes. So, I mean, the ironic thing is um, the damper it actually puts on physical supply, which is already tight in the global gold market. Yep, it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds. Something definitely to keep your eyes on in the coming uh, weeks and months. It could happen fast again if the creditor banks uh, pull their, their loans and their credit line. If you read the article, it certainly would not be hard to see that taking place if it hasn't already. Shifting gears a little bit again, I um, want to give the readers a brief update on the physical uh, demand in the, the gold and silver markets here in the U.S. And as we look at the, the U.S. mint numbers, I'm a bit surprised. Uh, Steve Bullion continues to see very strong sales into this uh, recent dip, but it's not really being substantiated by uh, sales at the U.S. Mint. Um, after selling 1. or 5.1 million silver eagles in January, the Mint only sold 1.2 million silver eagles in February. And here we are March 10th, so we're about a, a week and a half into March, and the Mint's only sold 280,000 silver eagles, so less than a quarter percent of capacity uh, minting output much less if they had any uh, extra inventory stocked up from uh, the last month. So with the uh, 
the dollar and a half decline that we've seen all the, over the past week, I'm a little surprised that the Mint's only been able to move 280,000 Silver Eagle coins, at least from what we've been seeing at SD Bullion. So, um, but really, I guess that is also substantiated from what we've been seeing in the 90% silver market. Um, 90% silver premiums have moved up maybe about a dime over the past week. Um, but uh, if you search hard enough, it's been able to find it here or there, even under spot. Um, but uh, c- across the wholesale market on hold, it's it's under a dollar over spot, and it's pretty readily available uh, from all the major wholesalers and suppliers. Uh, there's pretty readily available inventory, which is, uh, as regular listeners know, have listened to us for a while. It's a pretty telling indicator when the bag market has that much supply that um, inventories of investment-grade silver products are doing okay right now. So, yeah. um, well, would you say that it's interesting that we even managed to get a ten cent uh, uptick in the premium for ninety percent bags, given that silver's basically since March third gone straight down? I mean, uh, it, 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 uh, to me, that suggests there might be some stability coming in along with the same phenomenon we see with the you know mining shares catching a bid this morning, the HUI up over a percent as we speak, and gold and silver finally stabilizing. I mean, it, it looks like. Though we haven't seen continued decline in premiums with 90%, for example, matching up with what we see um, in the latter part of this week as being the market kind of stabilizing. I mean, it all yeah. gets back to what you were saying about whether or not the Fed is going to really be aggressive when it comes to their forward-looking guidance and job owning. I think that that's the main open question that no one can truly answer at this stage until we see what they do on Wednesday. But... Uh, yeah, I think it'll. I think Eric, uh, as far as your question on the the premium jump, small premium jump in the ninety percent, um, I'd like to see what happens if we stabilize here, whether that that holds or it eases back up. Because uh, one thing we do see in the the ninety percent market, and again for those who aren't familiar with the market, uh, inventory of ninety percent silver comes entirely from investors um, selling back coins that they're holding. They haven't been produced since 1964. They're not being minted. There's no new fresh supply coming onto the market. So it's entirely, the supply is entirely dependent on investors selling um, their coins back into the market. And what we often see in times when silver has the snot kicked out of it and suddenly over a couple of day period uh, drops a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, is that that does affect the small local coin shop selling back into the wholesale market. And what I mean by that is uh, any large dealer that's doing volume, whether at SD Bullion, how, where we had ounce per ounce, or any of the other main players, um, any other main retail dealers, any other the main wholesalers who had who hedge dollar for dollar, they they hedge their ounces for the dollar. Um, they're all hedging. So whether it's SD Bullion hedging ounce for ounce, um, we don't care if as far as uh, selling to customers, we're not going to hold back 90 percent and, and not offer it to customers if spot prices drop a dollar and a half uh, because we're repurchasing at that lower level and we're maintaining the the number of ounces. Um, and any other dealer that's hedging for dollars, they've gone short when they bought the inventory, so they don't care either because they're hedged for it. Whereas a lot of the, the smaller coin shops actually don't do that. They'll buy back from a customer um, a 50-face bag or 10-face of silver or 100-face bag and then they'll they'll post it on the dealer networks uh, looking to sell it and and suddenly if the silver price drops a dollar and a half some of those local coin shops do hold back their inventory hoping to see prices bounce back again I mean we we can just see in our dealer network that um, and, and we're talking about the dealer network of the smaller coin shops not the wholesalers we buy from but the smaller coin shops suddenly that has dried up of the 90% nobody's offering any bags the wholesalers still have plenty but all the smaller coin shops it's, it's hard to find since last Thursday so um, I think it's a little bit of a combination of the market dropping and demand picking up and I think there might be a little bit too of the smaller dealers holding 
holding back supply. So that's why I, I prefaced that with, uh, I'd like to see what the inventory looks like um, once prices stabilize and begin moving a bit higher. Does all that, does inventory reappear suddenly back in the market or is, is there still not much to be seen from those all those local coin shops across the country? If there's still not much to be seen, then yeah, that trend's gonna continue and prices, premiums on the 90% are probably gonna um, continue to tick higher. Yeah, and we should also say too, just for broader context, uh, you know, this whole uh, phenomenon with the mints numbers being pretty low this all year is set against the fact that the price discovery, and I say that in quotations, uh, <laughs> of the COMEX market and the LBMA secondarily is really what drives this, this overprice and, and, and by extension what happens with the physical demand going into China and to India and other places more so this year in particular versus the somewhat lackadaisical demand we're seeing in the U.S. Uh, and we we entered, uh, well, we, you know, a couple of days before February, we were at 1664 silver, and we went all the way up to, six, to 1854 silver right before the end of February. So that's like a dollar ninety move, and you would imagine that that would bring out animal spirits and people wanting to buy more silver. Yet the U.S. numbers, U.S. mint sales numbers stink, <laughs> and all the, all the while we've seen huge, huge bullion physical demand flowing into China, particularly with gold. We had that, you know, 150 plus metric ton surprise figure and moving from the Swiss refineries and imported into China back in December and a really strong January and, and so forth. And this whole phenomenon that we're seeing with the prices suddenly turning down with the weak demand that's pointed to by the you know US business press when they you know cite numbers like fed or excuse me the US treasury and the mint sales with bullion as their proof that the market is weak it's it's just a mirage it's all fake news it, it is a way of painting the tape and you know, our SD bullion sales are really strong in part because you guys are growing off of a small base and, and, and a new company growing. And it's, it's not the same thing as what we see in the broader market. But the, the paper market still reigns supreme, and they're manipulated to a very excessive extent. And, and, and you know, that's where we are. The precious metals price discovery mechanism is still 90% percent plus driven by the monkeys that attack comics and the way in which the powers that be shape sentiment when they do things like shaping interest rate expectations and on and on. And all the while we have, you know, the probably the best set of fundamental conditions for higher gold prices, which in turn drive everything else that you can imagine in, in many, many years other than arguably immediately after the financial crash and the turmoil that was going on then and with expectations for for QE programs and asset purchases by the Fed creating a you know huge amount of inflation in the pipeline other than that kind of backdrop with the eurozone possibly imploding with debt crisis and China getting more and more in focus with the, the geopolitical events going on with inflation rising and expectations for all the more inflation rising the fact that historically gold actually does do well in interest rate rising paradigms despite the fact that the mainstream media has basically lobotomized people when it comes to their understanding of financial history. I mean, I can go on and on and on. I could list 50 things right now that are unbelievably positive for precious metals. But, you know, and we're, we're in a funk now, and they'll probably turn after they raise interest rates for sure, if not already having turned today, where we're just kind of marking time, somewhat moving horizontally with a slight uptick in various areas where you can look, whether it's bullion or, or the, the mining shares. But uh, and it, it's, yeah. And that's without even adding on to potential game changers like uh, the ABX coming coming on in a physical um, market with electronic trading, but actually you have to purchase the physical bullion behind that. Um, sure. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to it. Uh, we'll post a link to it uh, on the write-up as well. Um, London trader Andrew McGuire had a pretty fascinating interview um, just up as well, and he's predicting basically a reset in the next 90 days due to 
all of the liquidity coming out of the COMEX um, market and heading towards uh, the ABX and the physically backed um, electronic exchanges where if you're a, a big fund or whatever and you want to trade electronically, but you have the choice of you can do it on COMEX where it's dang near impossible to take delivery and actually see any gold or doing it uh, on their exchange where you actually have the physical gold behind it. Um, there's certainly a lot of funds, uh, especially in the East, but even in the West as well, that um, if everything else is the same, if they can trade electronically in and out, but actually have allocated physical behind it, um, if it's just as easy and just as convenient, they're going to choose that um, rather than the COMEX. And what's interesting is, I mean, if the COMEX loses their volume, they're going to lose all that speculative momentum that they use to generate these massive smashes that you saw over the past week. Because all the energy, all the p potential energy for those smashes come from the specs buying on the way up and the bullion bank shorting into that and then dumping a massive amount of paper, triggering all of the specs to have um, right through their stop losses, and they have to liquidate, and then they they join the tsunami, and they become part of the problem. So if you That's right. if a lot of that liquidity dries up, the bullion banks lose that potential energy from the specs. Uh, I mean, they can't they can't they're not going to drop 100 million ounces of paper silver if they don't have uh, speculative potential energy behind it that they know is built up. That's going to uh, push it much further that they can then cover those new shorts because when they drop 150 million ounces of paper silver on the market uh, they consider that an investment and, and that investment is then uh, recouped by covering those shorts now look where we are today 17 1650 much lower so if you don't have all the potential energy from all the speculative buying that's been buying into the rally over the past three months, if that's going on in another exchange that's actually backed by physical where the bullion banks can't play, that certainly um, changes the dynamics a bit for what they're able to do um, playing games on the paper markets. Yeah, and to help our listeners who are new to all what goes on on the comics to contextualize it for them, you know, we are standing, we, we were, you know, 18 handle on silver and fell back down to 16 and change and now, you know, back over 17. And in this process, uh, we have had open interest level of contracts on the comics that are around 200,000 open contracts. And we haven't had that level. Uh, it, we've been elevated for, for many, many months, for over a year. And just to draw the comparison, when silver was making its run to 50 bucks, I mean, the, that was the kind of level that we had back then. Huge amount of interest in the market, everyone getting excited, pushing silver up and up. And now we're, we're near all-time highs once again with silver in the high teens. And the reason why we're at that level is that the rising level of expectations for, you know, the Trump win and the infrastructure spend and inflation ticking up and all of that going on in the latter part of last year brought us to a new phase of a bull market and silver took off and we had uh, the paper traders wanting in on the comics and instead of being able to play on a more physically allocated exchange like Doc was just describing, their, the price discovery worldwide is still largely set more so than not out of comics. And the bullion banks who are trying to manage this upward momentum in precious metals short the heck out of comics. They issue tons and tons of contracts and once again we you know we're pushing up against all time highs and in open interest and that's a product of you know JP Morgan having a physical vaulting system and ability to interface with comics where they're you know over forty some odd fifty percent of the physical vaults in the comic system of silver in conjunction with what you know the bullion banks do with the paper issuance and they're meeting the rising um tide of people who want to you know, get in on silver paper and all of those longs are being flushed 
with a huge amount of new contract issuance on the short side. And once they break the market, we have this giant shift beginning of March where silver gets clobbered. And then the momentum breaks, and, and then the, sh the shorts are covered by the bullion banks, and they actually make money manipulating the market by having the ability to have the house rules work in their favor and the ability to see what's going on as well, too. And that's the significance of J.P. Morgan's large vaulting system and the fact that when it comes to the, you know, the rhythms, the, the movement within comics itself and having the ability to have one of the largest, if not the largest, silver player in the comic system also controlling the, the lion's share of the fault with the physical movement and allocation that matches up against all of the hyper leverage of well over, you know, 150 to 1 representation for every ounce of, in a vault. There's, you know, 150 plus ounces of paper in silver. I mean, this is all... It's a charade. Uh, we, we've been hoping and uh, wishing that there would be more of a physical market largely driven in the East. And slowly but surely, we're moving into that paradigm. But it sure is taking a heck of a lot longer than anyone could have expected, including Andrew McGuire. But it sure at some is. Point, yeah, at some point, this is going to have to fade away for no other reason other than the fact that these low prices are literally destroying the mining industry. Uh, the forward you know, ability for miners to operate and continue to pull enough bullion out of the ground to meet ongoing physical needs, not just you know for monetary and jewelry considerations for gold, but industrial supply for silver too. I mean, it, it's it's creating a huge mess. So markets manipulated the way that they have been. Whether we're talking precious metals or creating the biggest bond market bubble in world history and what that does to the price of money. I mean, interest rates are the price of money, and you change the price of money. In order to price a currency, better said, for our purists who are listening, I slap myself in the hand. <laughs> you know, our fiat paradigm is completely screwed up anywhere you look, and and it's been a constant effort to try to maintain all these spinning plates in the air. Our our lovely people at the Fed and the Treasury and all of their compatriots around the world are hyper aggressive when it comes to trying to manage markets because they've already been doing it for so long they've created such big problems that there's no way around it. They have to they have to continue to manipulate everything to keep everything going. And uh, it uh, it's just it's a marvel marvel to watch. It really is. And this isn't a perfect analogy, but what comes to mind, um, to kind of put these things into layman's terms, is imagine you and all your buddies fly out to Vegas and you spend a whole month out there in Vegas gambling and you just keep losing money nonstop and the house keeps winning. So then you finally decide, hey, you're going to go back to the hotel and you and all your buddies, you're just going to play hold them together. So when you make that decision, the house automatically loses because the house can't win if you're not playing in their rigged casino anymore. So that's not the, exactly a perfect scenario or a perfect analogy, but um, it's kind of what we're, we're talking about here with uh, the liquidity uh, moving out of the COMEX and into a, a physical exchange like the ABX. Uh, the bullion banks can't win anymore if uh, you leave their rigged paper system because they can't play in the physical system. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a long time coming, but it is an evolution that continues to move in a direction of more markets with greater physical emphasis taking a greater role. I mean, China is the, by far the largest consumer of gold and silver, and that definitely is a major factor in their desire to have honest markets. Right. All right, so we've got a lot to look forward to, not only for the, the coming months and year, but just in this week ahead. We've had a lot of trading action over the past week, and look for even more volatility in the next uh, 72 trading hours, uh, particularly culminating on Wednesday when uh, the FOMC meets and gives their announcement. So uh, we'll wrap this week's show there. For The Doc and Eric Dubin, thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets.